Hey, let's pray together. Lord, we do come to worship you because you alone are worthy of our worship. And so we sing to you, but we know that worship is more than singing. We proclaim together what we know to be true and what we desire to be true in our lives as we worship you with our lives. And so, Lord, we thank you for how you've been at work in our lives throughout this past year and in our church for the stories that we have heard and a million more because you're always drawing us to you. And Lord, do that even now as we consider that first Christmas when you came to uh, uh, the earth and into our lives. And Lord, I pray that you'll draw us all to you today. I pray for everyone here, all of us uh, struggling and wrestling with with things uh, in life, relationally. I pray for those who are here today, skeptics and cynics and and those who uh, are here curious, Lord, all of us are on a journey. And so I pray that you'd speak to every person. Lord, help me to get out of the way, but to be used as a vessel for you to hear your word and to apply it to our lives. And so we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. It is great to see you today. Uh, go ahead and turn in your Bible to Matthew, is where we're going to be. Matthew chapter 2 today. Uh, if you've been with us, and a lot of you have been throughout Advent season, our, our premise has been that uh, the way that God came to us in the person of Jesus, um, and how he came and to whom he came, tells us a lot about who he is. So if you've been with us, we looked, of course, at Mary, this vulnerable teenage girl, um, and her fiance, whose lives were completely disrupted, out in this little town, podunk town of Nazareth, where there may be a thousand people, more likely 500 people or so, who lived in this tight knit Jewish community. Last week we looked at the shepherds uh, on the fields outside of, of Jerusalem in Bethlehem, just five miles south of Jerusalem there. And uh, we saw that God shows up in unexpected ways, unexpected times. They've got the night shift. They're just normal people like the rest of us, uh, that God shows up uh, to all of us. And today we're going to look at the Magi. What is up with the Magi? This story is fascinating. And I've taken a deep dive through the years, but particularly the past week or so, uh, into who are these magi and why in the world are they in this story? Um, now, the quick answer, of course, is, well, because it happened. Um, but there's much more to it. And what I want us to do is get underneath this story. You find it in Matthew 2, where we see uh, these magi who show up, wise men. We, we, we sing about them as kings. We're going to get a bit more detail of who, who these guys are. Fascinated with uh, the magi. And so what I want us to do, though, here's what's going to happen. We're going to, now this is the case in every sermon, um, you're, you're going to take a journey with me as I say out loud how the Spirit has spoken to me as I consider how he's speaking to our church family, what the text says. And today we're going to take a journey in the text of how we get to Jesus. Now this is always the case, but here we're going to follow, we're actually going to track along with the Magi. You're going to see why I'm calling them magi in a moment, but we're going to follow along. And here's what happens when you, when you go to seminary and learn how God reveals himself to us. And you know, this intuitively, it goes like this. It's like a funnel. There's general revelation. If you know this story, you can track with me right now. There's natural revelation. We call it God reveals himself to us in nature, right? He revealed the heavens display his glory. Uh, a baby is born. Love, what is that if there is not some transcendent reality? What is good or bad if there's not transcendent reality? And that's where we're going in our, our culture. I've talked about that a lot. There's no good or bad. There's no right or wrong if there's no ultimate good. So it all points us to an ultimate God. All this to say, natural revelation, general revelation points us to God. But we don't stop there. Then comes, like a funnel, to specific revelation where God speaks to us specifically. And he does this with the Magi. He does it with us. How does he do it with us? Through scripture. Specifically, he speaks to us. And then finally, personally, he speaks to us individually as we encounter Jesus. The scriptures point us specifically to who he is. And it speaks to us. The word of God, can say it this way, points us to the word in the flesh, 
Jesus. It all points to Jesus. And our spiritual journey goes to Jesus. The, the magic, I take this progression. And so I want to speak to, I'm speaking to everybody here today, but I want to speak to, sure enough, and praying for the spiritual seeker, okay? The spiritual seeker. Um, and if you're here, you're likely a seeker, unless you were kind of drug here today, and you're, you're, but you're here by purpose. I believe that God has you here today. If you're a cynic, if you have a lot of questions, like me, like, like all of us, I think, we're all on a journey some of us, you, you, you can say a little closer to Jesus, perhaps, in our reality and understanding of him, walking with him, abiding in him. Others of us are, are far away. I had a parent, a mom, who, who said she puts out the nativity scenes, as we'll see here today. Um, and when she does, she puts the magi at the other end of the, of, of like the mantle, uh, just historically accurate. Like, you know, they weren't there with the shepherds. We'll talk about that today. We don't know exactly when, but I think that's, that's not bad, you know, but we bring them all together. They're all part of the Christmas story. I get that. Um, but you could put them like on another table and the kids, why are they over there? They're on their way. They're coming. Um, they're going to get here. So look at this. Let's, let's, let's do this. Here's how I'm going to break it down. Take notes on sermons. I, I challenge you to do so. Um, we're going to consider the clues. First of all, this is how our spiritual journey goes every day and all the time. And I want to challenge you if you're a cynic, if you're skeptical, if you're not a believer in Jesus, and you know this, you're not a Christian, or maybe you're questioning whether you are not, the journey is going to be consider the clues, first of all, then track down the truth, and then finally, without any other option, when you, come in, when you encounter Jesus, bow down and worship him. That's how this is going to go. And so first we find ourselves in Matthew 2, verse 1. Matthew narrates. Here we go. He's speaking to Jews primarily by the way, which uh, comes into play. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod, the king, behold, so he says, okay, look, stop, look. Wise men from the east came to Jerusalem. So a first hearer, first reader, would he says, okay, look, check this out. Magi came from the east. Now they all would go, oh, wow, Magi, how about that? They would know exactly who we're talking about. We don't so much. So we're going to dive into that. Here's some clues. He puts us in historical context. Uh, Herod died about 4 BC. Now, I don't want you to throw this off too much, but you know that Jesus was not born on December 25th, like 2023 years ago. He was, he was born, in fact, miscalculations along the way um, in our timing. He still splits history in BC and AD. He is the central figure of all history. But he was born likely, some would say six. BC, I think somewhere between six and four BC, um, but right close to the time that Herod died, because Herod's alive, we know this, um, and he, he died soon after this. I think all of this, the, um, his, his, his leaving to go to Egypt, Jesus ends up in this refugee family, part of the story we won't get to today, uh, a, a kind of exodus out of Egypt, now this better Moses coming back and leading the way, uh, then because Herod dies. This is after the massacre of the innocents, of, of the babies who, who are killed by Herod, who by this time is paranoid, crazy man. And, and he in history tells us so. And if you wanna know how Herod died, by the way, just Google that. I can't even explain it from the pulpit because I don't want to. It's freaky crazy, okay? It's like so many people who are prideful, God took him down, and it is a nasty death, is how he dies. That's for you to check out on your own. Don't have time for it. But while, we're in, uh, while we were in Israel recently, we had, a, um, we had a guide that was obsessed with Herod. Um, some of you know Shmulek, our guide. He is obsessed with Herod, and for good reason. Herod the Great was an incredible political leader. He played the religious leaders of the day, the Jews. He played towards Augustus, you know, Caesar. And uh, he played both sides incredibly well. And he leveraged all kinds of power and influence. In fact, when you go there, you'll go and see uh, the temple, the, the, the second temple mount, which he built. He was not Jew by blood. He builds it for his people. You know, he's king of the Jews. And he, he built uh, Masada, You've heard about Masada, perhaps. He built the Herodium. He built Caesarea Philippi. It's all there in ruins, but it's there. And it is amazing. 
This guy was an incredible leader and of great influence. Now, Matthew here is contrasting even. There are a lot of uh, Easter eggs throughout this passage that we could look at. He's contrasting Herod the king up against Jesus the king. And the incredible contrast between the two. But he's a brilliant politician, builder, and he is in charge, right? He's a vassal, you know, king under the leadership of, of Caesar in Rome. But he's playing all sides. So here it says in verse 2, look at this, saying where, and this word saying over and over again, these, these wise men, these magi show up, where is he who's born in the king of the Jews? They're creating quite a stir. For we saw his star, what? When it rose and have come to worship him. So who are these men? And what's up with the star? Let's dive deeper into it. I think in large part, okay, the star, this savior has come for the whole wide world and for the entire universe. In fact, the Magi showing up in Matthew 2 is Matthew's way of saying what Luke says in chapter 2, verse 10. The angels say to the shepherds, this good news of great joy is for what? Anybody? All people. This is what Matthew's telling us in his own way through this story to a Jewish audience who would understood what he's talking about here. But who were these wise men? Now, there's no mention of, you know this, don't you? There's no mention of three wise men, okay? Um, there's three gifts, but as we'll see here, I don't, they, I don't think they had like little, and I've got nativities all over my house, but they're not little gifts. They're not like, here, unpack this. Like, what is, is this? Like, a, what is this? Um, no, they had massive amounts of gifts. And there aren't just three. There could have been many, many, many magi, likely a caravan of people. So they show up, and we'll see in a moment, they get audience with the king, Herod, and you don't get an audience with him. These are influential people. And the best translation really is magi. It's a transliteration which means just taking the Greek letters and forming a new word because we don't have anything like these guys. There's no modern day equivalent of these magi. Um, in fact, they're, they're not, sorry, our carols and anthems betray us. They're not kings. They, they are never called kings in the Bible. Uh, they're, they're, you could say wise men, they're wise, but think of a mishmash of scientists, astronomers, astrologers, political leaders, with incredible sway. Uh, some have said they're not kings, but they're king makers. These guys could endorse, bless a king, or demote a king based on their perspective and their voice. These are powerful, powerful men. And we'll see there's this syncretism of natural science, of spirituality, they're very spiritual men. And, and here's what's important to understand. Taking a moment here to understand this. In Daniel chapter 2, verse 48, it says that Daniel was promoted. Remember, Daniel could interpret dreams. Daniel was a political leader, a governmental leader in Babylon. Remember, 600 years before Jesus uh, is, is born. God's people, take, overtaken by, by the Babylonians, the, the first temple is destroyed, Jerusalem is destroyed. They're sent out in exile, deported. They're sent to Babylon. Now, the capital of Babylon, where Daniel and his friends end up, is just south of Baghdad, modern-day Iraq. I believe these guys, it says they're from the east. They are from Iraq, likely. Iran, they're east of the Jordan, east of, of now Jordan. And they've come a long way, probably months, to get to Jerusalem. Now, what's important and fascinating to me, that they're, they, you can track them, this is like a tribe, all the way back to Daniel. Now think about this. The Jewish people are in exile. They're sent into Babylon. We know that Daniel was a leader of great influence for decades. He ends up being prime minister. He's also, he also is taking with him the word of God, the Torah, the law, their story. He's even prophesying of a coming king, of the Messiah to come. Not only Daniel, but all of the Jews who go. So we can see their influence and these magi, some say they go all the way back to Abraham, certainly back to Daniel. They knew a lot more scripture than we give them credit for. 
They are now seeing general revelation, something in the sky, natural um, phenomenon that comes to them. And they're going to piece it together. Scripture, natural phenomenon, all that's happening, this, this challenge within them, the Spirit of God moving them. I am amazed by the faith of these, these magi. I mean, they're on a journey. However, Matthew places them here. They are pagans. They're not Israelites, right? They are, we'd call them secular today, except that secular means non-spiritual. They were spiritual. But we, we would probably place them in kind of this secular, just, you know, and, and think about this. Where do secular people go seeking truth? And it makes up a lot, most now, people say, majority of people in America today. Where do we go seeking truth and purpose in life? Science, what we can measure and experiment with, right? Or politics. That's how we're finally going to make the world right. The Magi do exactly that. But they've got something that we don't have. It's what uh, Charles Taylor calls in his massive book on how we got to where we are. It's called A Secular Age. Christmas reading for you. It's about 900 pages if you want to dive in. But what he says in it, he says, here's what, here's what we have lost. We are now disenchanted, is his word. Meaning, we're no longer enchanted by the transcendent. Delighted. We, no, we are no longer drawn to the transcendent. The wise men were. I mean, they start with that premise. Like, there's something beyond us. Very spiritual. But they don't have the answer. So, we're tracking with them. They're on this journey. They, they, they're considering all the clues. And what's fascinating in this story, again, all kinds of, of clues that Matthew brings to us in this story. And you, you know the story, probably. We see contrast between Herod and Jesus... We see, uh, we see um, uh, gosh, flashbacks to Balaam receiving gifts from King, King Balak in the Old Testament where Balak is afraid, uh, he's a Moabite king, he's afraid of the Jewish people, so he's bringing gifts to appease Balaam. And we also see that uh, the Queen of Sheba does the same thing with Solomon, uh, bringing gifts, and it says no one gave gifts to Solomon like the Queen of Sheba. We see, we see, so put your Jewish hat on and they're going, wow, wait, whoa, wow. What he's doing is he, he's showing us Jesus is the better king. Like the book of Hebrews, he's the better Moses. He's the better king. Even in the story of Moses, we have the killing of babies, right? And you have now Jesus coming out of Egypt ultimately. But we see their, their first step is to consider the clues and I'm challenging us all. If you're a skeptic, or really all of us, consider the fact that we've been created by God and that we, you know, Scripture, we talk about, um, we, we talk about how he's created everything and us in his image. And, he, and he's calling us to him. And if you're a, a skeptic here today, if you're not a believer, we know what we call intelligent design is within creation. It's called the teleological argument for the existence of God, which means everything is created with a purpose. Everything has purpose. Even the atheist sees it. There's an intelligent design behind it all, and there must be an intelligent designer. And again, all that is good and wonderful in the world points us to God. But we have lost what the Magi had. And I, and I would challenge you today. Are you open to the transcendent, to the spiritual things that are happening around you. Because there's more here than meets the eye. And too often we get educated into the intelligentsia like the Magi, and we leave God behind. Many people consider the clues and they stop there. And we'll not go further because God, they know, will demand something of them and we just don't wanna go there. Now, what's up with this star? What is going on here? Now, there's a lot that's been said about the star. You might know that uh, Johannes uh, Kepler, who was uh, an astronomer in the 16th century, he was the first one to say it was a, a conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn coming together, which, to, which happens kind of regularly, not, not regularly, but in astronomical senses or, or terms. It happens every now and then. Um, and sure enough, nowadays we have models that can reverse and we can find out exactly what was going on in the sky when Jesus, around the time Jesus was born. We don't know exactly when it was. And sure enough, 
Kepler was right. He did all the, the, you know, the math behind it way back when, but there was a conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn right by the time when Jesus was born. It would have been a bright phenomenon in a lifetime. It would have been really bright. Um, now we have those every now and then I checked this out April 30th this past year, Venus and Jupiter aligned and none of you knew it because you were asleep because now, you know, Pete Delkus, our friend or, or others might've told us it was happening, but, um, it was actually, it was Jupiter. Yeah, it was, it was Jupiter and Venus that came together. Uh, makes a big bright light in the sky. Now I say that because well then how in the world, it says that it was over the child, right? And you like me, I've always thought, what, how did this happen? Um, do planets stop? Well, they seem to at times. It's called a retrograde motion. And it's when, when you have a planet, okay, we're on this balancing, we're on this platform. Here comes a planet, let's say. Planet, by the way, literally means moving, um, traveling star is what it means. That's the etymology of the word. But a planet comes, let's say it's moving, but watch this. As it rotates and comes towards me, in a moment that it comes towards me, it looks like it stopped. Oh, it's moving, but it stopped. Anyway, all that said, those of you who would like to put, you know, let's put some natural causes around all this stuff, that still doesn't explain that it comes over the, the, where the child was, as we'll see, and they find him. So a lot of that, you're like, Jeff, move on. Because a lot of that doesn't play for me. It doesn't matter. This is a miraculous event that takes place. So to try to explain it through science, and my point is this, too often consider the clues, and we stop at at the natural revelation of God. And we don't go any further because we've lost a sense of the transcendent. Don't do it. Keep moving forward. And if you don't have the belief, you don't have faith that other people have around you and you wish you did and all the things, I just challenge you to keep on moving. Keep moving forward like the, like the wise men did. Keep pressing on, okay? So we consider the clues and next we track down the truth. You've got to do this. And this is what they do. Look at this. Look at verse 3. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all of Jerusalem with him. Okay, King Herod is paranoid by this point. I mean, he was already paranoid and crazy. And we know this through history. Um, but he's like, wait, I'm the king of the Jews. What do you, wait, what? There's a king of the Jews. So you can see how he's, he's, he's concerned. And all the people are concerned. Why? Because Herod's crazy. And because anytime there's a regime change, there's going to be bloodshed. Everybody is nervous about this. There, I mean, it's quite, quite a stir, these, this caravan showing up. Look at verse 4. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes and people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. So he's playing the religious leaders again, playing the side of Caesar, and, and you know, because he's really a vassal king, puppet king under him. And, and so here he's, he's brought this group together. They, they really are like spies to him. But he's trying to understand further what's going on here. You guys know. Um, and then it says in verse 5, they told him in Bethlehem of Judea. And they quote to him, then Micah 5, 2, that he's going to be born in Bethlehem. Right? Now, don't miss this. The Magi knew enough scripture to get them to Jerusalem. They knew enough. Um, they knew enough to get there because he's king of the Jews. Where are you going to go? The, the, the capital. Like, is this the king's son? Who is this? They get to the capital. They're looking for Jesus. The point is here, natural revelation, specific revelation found in God's word, which is why if you're not in his word, you're not getting specific revelation from him on a daily basis. Because discipleship is following him every day and coming to decision points, a million decisions every single day based on what you know of God's word. That's how you know how to live your life and to follow him. And it's not just an intellectual thing. You're dwelling with him, abiding in him. Look at verse seven. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and, as and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem saying, go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and <clears throat> worship him. Right? He wants to kill him. He wants to take him out. This is how crazy here it is. I mean, this is a guy who's killed his own family members. 
uh, to get to where he is and to remain in power. But we, we all, here's the point, we all must track down the truth. We, we've got to consider not just natural, right, revelation, but that God speaks to us in his word. And, and are you a believer that he does that? You say, well, how would I know? You would be in his word. Uh, if, if Shmulek was obsessed with Herod, listen, you and I should be obsessed with Jesus. Obsessed with God's word. Are you? How would I know? You'd be in it. You'd be reading it every day. You would be learning more about it all. Because here's what happens. Consider a pilot. We have some pilots in here in the room, likely. Yes, we've got several. So we have pilots in our church family. Pilots know this more than I do. My dad was a pilot. He was in the Air Force, but I don't know. Here's what I do know. You get in a plane, you you set your direction. You got your radar, you know where you're heading. You take off in that direction. When you get closer for landing, uh, you have vectors. They, and the tra- air traffic controllers send out vectors to tell you exactly how you're going to land this plane and where. God's word moves us from natural revelation, which is clear. Paul tells us in Romans 1. It's clear that there's a God. Without scripture, it's clear. A- and then he says, but in the word of God, we get vectors to come specifically he reveals himself to us and most specifically in Jesus Christ who now by his spirit is alive in everyone who believes so we have personal specific and personal vectors personal direction in our lives and so here's what I want to want to want to challenge you with this is exciting in January of 2023 that's coming quick our entire church family and all of our friends that we invite to do this. We're going to be reading God's word every single day together. Every one of us reading the same text every day. Not a lot, but we're going to be in the word, dwelling in the word every single day. This is really exciting. It's not a program. It's not read through the Bible. It's aligned with the sermon series that we're preaching. And we're all going to be reading assigned text throughout the entire year. Imagine this. Every member, you, in God's word, every single day. Applying his word to our lives. That will change our church. That will change me. That will change each one of us. Because when we get in his word, listen, God speaks. He speaks. He can speak through the preaching of his word. He can speak through biblical revelation as we seek to obey him. He speaks to us in his word. Friends, we consider the clues, but we've got to track down the truth. And it happens as we stay in his word, as we're in his word. That's the great challenge for you. We so want to make disciples here, not who simply show up on on Sunday morning, but who are following Jesus every single day. And it happens as we're in his word, listening to him. Now, finally, once we consider Uh, The clues, we track down the truth in his word and we come then, his word points us to Jesus himself and we bow down and worship him. There's no other option when you come face to face with him. So look at verse nine. After listening to the king, they went on their way and behold, there he is again. Look, look, don't miss this. The star that they had seen when it rose went before them until they came to rest over the place where the child was. Now, you can imagine, okay, day, a night, a day, and another night. So the, the, the star appears, but now it seems miraculously. This is this is a miraculous phenomenon. It's over where the child was. They, they go there, they follow to where it is. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. I love these guys. They are, I mean, pursuing the Savior. They know enough, and they want to find him. Their faith is amazing. And I do believe this is in Bethlehem, by the way. That's another side, side story that we could get into because in Luke chapter 2, verse 39, it says that after his, um, after his circumcision, Jesus, eight days later, Mary went through all that, Lord, that the law was re- that required of her, which would have been a 40 days of purification. And then it says, and then they went back to their hometown in Nazareth. Wait, what? He doesn't tell us how long that period of time might have been when they went back. 
But he opens the door that the, that the Magi could have gone to Nazareth. Now, I still believe it's Bethlehem because, and I'll tell you why here in a moment. Because, well, you know, Herod tells them later, he says, to tell, you know, he, they, they don't obey Herod. They go a different way. They go home by another way. I think he would have told us that here. I think Matthew would have told us they didn't go to Bethlehem. They went to Nazareth. So I think they're in Bethlehem, which would have made a lot of sense. Um, just talk to a newborn mom. You don't want to jump on a donkey and travel about 60, you know, 80 miles with a newborn. And if you don't understand that, talk to a newborn mom. She'll, she'll tell you that, can I have months here, please? Now watch this, verse 11. And going into the house, oh, house. Going into the house, oikos is the word. They saw the child. He's not a, watch this, brephos. He's not a baby. He's not a newborn. This also is an unborn child. This is John the Baptist, brephos, baby in the womb. This is a, this could be three months. I mean, he could be six months. He could be a toddler. He could be one year old. But he's not a newborn which is really interesting. So get some clarity there. And they felt, they saw his, saw his mother, Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshiped him. That's a legit translation there. Proskyneo, laid out before him, at least bowing down before the king. They know that this, this baby is a king. Now, could they have known everything? They didn't know it all, but they knew they're, in, they're, they're before some divine leader. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts. Here's where we get the three, right? Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Now, much has been written about the three uh, gifts. And um, not only for the, for the sake of time, but we don't really need to go there because uh, really what Matthew's telling us here, they're bringing the very best they have from their culture. That's what they're bringing. Oswald Chambers is the one who said, worship is giving to God the very best he's given to us. That's what they're doing. And I think they brought a lot and they brought the very best that they have. I'm struck by the persevering faith of these magi. Faith does not go against reason. Faith precedes reason. And if we will continue the journey, then we'll do what they did. They move from natural revelation to specific revelation found in scripture and they find Jesus they come to him if you're a skeptic today if you're not a believer in Jesus I challenge you to continue to take the same journey in fact I challenge you to give your life to him right now you say well I don't know I'm, I'm kind of waiting I'm, I'm breaking down some barriers here thank you very much no God's waiting on you because faith precedes understanding. You come to him and you believe. You humble yourself before him because the personal revelation of Jesus himself, even my word and opening scripture today, is a personal invitation to you to make a decision. And this is for all of us. What are we going to do with this text, with this challenge? The king did not, this king did not go after those who threatened him because he was not threatened. This is the king of kings. This is the king who wasn't going out trying to kill everybody. Instead, he's arrested and sentenced to die for us. In fact, Pilate asked him, are you the king of the Jews? And then uh, Pilate brought him before the people and asked them, shall I crucify your king? And then they, playing to him, playing to earthly powers like we do, they say, we don't have any king but Caesar. And then in John 19, 19, it says that Pilate issued an order that a notice be prepared that was placed over Jesus while he's on the cross to mock him unto death. This says, Jesus of Nazareth, king of the Jews. This was the king, friends. Because we know the rest of the story. He died on the cross after living a perfect life for us because he, we could not. And he does it for us as our substitute. He, this king gives his life for us. He dies, not to power over us, but instead in this upside down kingdom, he invites us in to pursue the truth found in him because truth is found in a name. And his name is Jesus. 
And then before he ends up in this refugee family in Egypt, before the murder of the massacre, uh, the, the, the massacre of the innocents, before all that takes place, before Herod dies, it says here in verse 12, and being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. Listen, once you encounter the truth, it's the singular voice that you listen to. Once you come into relationship with Christ, there's no greater voice. Doesn't matter who it is. Every other voice is silenced as we listen to God, as he speaks to us through his word, always in community. My challenge for you today is this. If you're not a member of our church, you need to join today. What are you waiting on? If you've been coming, because you need to be in the body. And if you're not in his word, what are you waiting on? Don't wait till Christmas Eve. Don't wait till the next Sunday. Walk with him daily. And we're going to help you do that in the coming year. But every day we follow him because this king deserves everything we have. We pursue him. We consider the clues. We track down the truth and we bow down and we worship him with our lives. Amen. Praise be to God. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for this word that you've given to us. We praise you for the fact that you are the king of kings. You're the great king. And we worship you, not simply to come and sing to you how glorious it has been, but now to go like the wise men to listen to your voice, not the other million voices coming into our heads and into our hearts. We go now to listen to you and to serve you and obey you alone. And may we go and tell the world that you have come to save us. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.